Sekua. Up close is a daily current affairs show that profiles men and women making waves in their industries and gives newsmakers a human face. The program also gives newsmakers a platform where they can share their stories and vision as we hope to inspire you, our viewer. So stay tuned with us for the next half hour as we talk to internationally acclaimed comedian John Lismus. Zimbabwean born John Vlismus has been in the stand up comedy business for more than 15 years. He moved to South Africa at age eight and got his drama diploma from the Durban University of Technology back in 1993. Not only has John had great success performing at internationally acclaimed venues, he also has an impressive portfolio of films and television projects as an actor, producer, and director. He has also been credited with unearthing local comedy talents such as Joey Rustin and David Gao, and co-founded the Comics Choice Award. John, wow, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. I'm so <laughs> glad to have had you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Very interesting career. 15 years, John. Uh, it's closer to 20, but um, I didn't unearth the talent of David Cow or Joe yes, yes, They yes. unearthed themselves. Yeah, we, we, I you know. know. You don't, you don't like to credit yourself with having done that, but, yes. but the industry credits you with having done well, that. Well, that's very nice of the industry. Um, but I think talent's got to climb out of the ground itself. It can't be pulled out. You know. Yeah, certainly. And of course, as the public, you say 20 years, we also think we know who you are. But you tell us, who is John Lismus? Well, um, you know, I um, was a drama student, as you pointed out, and, uh, and born in Zimbabwe to a South African mom uh, um, and a Zimbabwean dad. And um, I moved my family when I was eight because I realized that um, <laughs> show business and the plans of Mr. Robert Mugabe may not go hand in hand. He had other plans. So, so we moved to South Africa. And... Um, and then um, while I was studying acting, I realized there was, there was very little work for actors, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was also quite a weird transition period where I, I kind of knew that um, the priorities of a sort of a young white male may not be the priorities of a nation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'd have to start making other plans, uh, which I did. And um, stand-up comedy always excited me because it's like a kind of a free form. Um, it's kind of rock climbing without ropes and a plan as opposed to acting where you've got a script and a director and a, you know, mm -hmm. a, a plan. Mm -hmm. So I felt that was the most free form of verbal expression uh, at which to perhaps try and make a living. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. And there were just a series of opportunities that came along. And before I knew it, I had moved to Joburg um, and I got to the Montreal Festival and, and I got a TV um, show at the, all around the same time. Mm. So for the first time ever, there was a comic who, who had opportunities that other yes. comics perhaps hadn't had, and that shifted things slightly. Mm. And uh, mm. ever since it changed then, changed the industry quite a lot. Sure, mm. but if you look at the changes that are happening now, uh, you know you've got people like Trevor who are playing sold out, you know, concert shows around the country, mm -hmm. doing good stuff on American TV. So, so those changes are happening even bigger and even faster and mm -hmm. that's quite exciting. Mm. Let's, Let's go see. back uh, in your story Okay. Uh, before you were eight years old. Do you remember anything about growing up in Zimbabwe? I'm interested to know. What was that there? Um, you, know, you know, I think every child has got similar memories um, mm. um, of everything is bigger and um, everything is very important. Sure. And, and um, so I have a vague memory um, of, of being, um, whether I'd grown up, let's say, in Durban or Harare or, um, you know, um, London. Yeah. Um, I have some memories, but they're, they're fairly, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, they're fairly generic. For, I mean, I was a fairly happy kid. Um, um, I think my more formative stuff happened in high school, which okay. was in Durban. Um, I think I started to realize that I was more comfortable being friends with the outcasts um, of, of my sort of um, year. Mm -hmm. So the guys that were maybe a bit eccentric or a bit crazy mm -hmm. or not perhaps all physically there or mentally slightly different, those are my people, and so we bonded. I learned early that being part of the team is not always a good thing. Um, mm. but because, you know, for me, a, a sports team is basically we've, we've formed an artificial strength around a, a weakness, which is insecurity, and then we pile 
you know, full strength onto that. So mm -hmm. we're not just in the team. Now we wear the jersey. We're not in the team, but we scream for the team and we bond with other people around televisions and bras because we feel insecure and we need to belong. I have always felt the other way, that you shouldn't belong. To, my dad always taught me from young. I have a great relationship with my folks, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, which is unusual for a comedian. But, um, but my father always taught me to not be afraid of standing alone and not always having to be part of a group. Mm. And as I've it's grown funny up, you should say that. I mean, the comedians that I've been chatting to so far, all of them say, oh, we've got great parents who have been very supportive of our careers. Mm. And I'm like, I don't believe that. You know, most yeah. parents, they want their kids to follow, like, you know, formal professions and, you know, have two and a half babies. And, yes. you know, let's, let's, go, let's go back to when you were eight years old. Do you know why your parents decided to move to South Africa? Um, I think it had a lot to do with the fact that my mum is South African okay. and most of her family were here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that as you get older in your life, generally the trend I've noticed is that you like to get back to your kind of beginnings. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think that was the one thing. And, um, and the fact that my dad has always never really been, um, he's not a man who's in, in big on tradition or culture, therefore his roots maybe meant less to him. Um, than my okay. mum, um, and so I think the move was wasn't difficult, and you know I think um, you know at the time as well there, there's that the famous movement of you know mm -hmm. white people down Africa mm -hmm. as it reverted back to its rightful ownership, white people migrate, and and um, and you and, let it in Durban, not Cape Town, because that's where everybody goes. Well, apparently Cape Town, <laughs> but uh, you know we didn't have criminal records, we didn't have uh, you know the things that Cape Town. Arrivals normally uh, had. Uh, they were chased out of Europe. There's the difference. Um, so I think Durban was just a good middle mm. spot. And I'm quite grateful because Joburg is not a simple place. You've got to get your head around Joburg. Um, I love it and it's my home and I'm a big fan of the city of Joburg mm. now. But when I first moved here from Durban, I, I must admit it was quite Explain traumatic. Explain that a little bit because I actually went to school in KZN as well. Okay. And I do see that difference. I mean, but to put it in your own words, what, what, what is it for a, a child growing up and still be in school? Um, I think Durban is more re relaxed mm. and there's the ocean and there's the, the warm weather to keep everything kind of subdued. I think here it's all about the action. And, uh, and um, Joburg's a very motivated place. You have to fit in and find your... Mm -hmm. you know, but but mm -hmm. the opportunities are here. So I think it's intimidating when you've been raised in a much more subdued, at a much more subdued pace mm -hmm. to suddenly hit the big city. But luckily I came in as a bit older and I was hungry, so I, I kind of found my, my groove. Now mm -hmm. I wouldn't change living here for anything. Oh, seriously? Anywhere you, would, you, would, you would not go back to Durban? No. You, to bring up your kids, nothing? No, unfortunately my daughter has been uh, born here and she'll be raised here. We go there often to visit okay. parents and things and we both, my daughter and I have started to love surfing and uh, things I didn't do as a child. So we do go back and we do have fun there, but it's great to have fun in Derbs, as most Johannesburg sure. people know, and then come back to work. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. After the break, we'll continue to get up close with John Flismus. We would greatly appreciate any suggestions or comments. My Twitter handle is at Tsepi Mutsukua. Stay with us, ABC News. These f***ing Indians. No one said that. No one. You guys are so good at just fucking hiding. No, stay down. Stay down. Stay down. Let them kill each other. Then we will take um slanga. Welcome back as we continue to get up close with John Vlismas. And I said it right, right? Yeah, you can I'm say so it proud of like. myself. Yeah, but you did a great job. <laughs> John, um, let's, let's move. You say you, you, know, you used to hang around more with the outcasts, uh, the eccentric kids mm. in high school. When did you start to realize that you could perform and you could make people laugh? So when did that start to happen? 
Um, you know, I always, um, humor has always been big in our family. Um, and uh, and I think that's very important when you're raising kids to okay. have humor. I think Who's the funny one, mommy or daddy? They're both funny in their own way. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, 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 in fact, both my folks had some kind of performance um, in their background, not huge or professional, but they certainly did. My grandfather on my mum's side was actually um, a really colorful human being. Okay. He was at times a gold miner, a panel beater, um, a clown, oh, a wrestler. Wow. Um, um, you know, he was just one of those really amazing human beings. So, so a lot came from him. Um, I think during school, I realized that I was against the idea of being in a system. Mm. For, when I realized that I would, this was my future for the next 10 years, I, I was so angry. I think I stayed angry for about eight years. Since so like class two? Exactly. <laughs> as soon as I realized that I had to dress like this and behave like this and do all of this, like without any form of option to, you know, ask if there was an appeal or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, and so I found humor was a great outlet and, and um, I doubted the system f from a very young age. Um, and um, so it was largely in high school when the pressure came on to, to get out of there. Um, I really started doing a lot of um, messing around, a lot of being the class clown and stuff. And then I realized that girls would actually uh, listen uh, to you a lot more if you made them laugh. Mm -hmm. So that was always a big incentive. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then I realized that maybe this was something I should do professionally. Uh, uh, tell me, wh what is it about, about you? I mean, a lot of people will have difficulty with the, you know, the system, as we may call it. But mm. what is it about you that even now you choose to um, mold yourself like on the fringe? I mean, I was looking at some of your pictures. I don't know mm. if we can play them now. I was looking at some of your pictures and the tattoos, the earrings. It's like you, you go all out, you know, to, yes. to be on the fringe. Why is that? Because I don't think the fringe really deserves the reputation that it has. Okay. I think that we, we, we refuse constantly to acknowledge the fact that the damage that has been done to our world largely has been done by men in suits has been done at boardroom tables has been done in churches has been done by all these people who use the veneer of respectability in order to conduct their devilish kind of business whereas rock stars people who you know look interesting like artists people who've chosen to express themselves openly and honestly are often blamed for all of these ills mm. you know the fact that Marilyn Manson was supposedly somehow responsible for the Columbine shootings a town which actually manufactures weapons for sale in mm. other countries mm. you know the fact that the US has just sold Saudi Arabia uh, 643 million dollars worth of cluster bombs like three months ago now we're complaining about Syria so I am constantly on the side of the individual who wants to just express themselves and shouldn't be persecuted because we come from a history where people were color coded simply by your external, let's call it your tattooing, mm -hmm. you were mm -hmm. discriminated against. Surely we should be teaching our children that that's completely irrelevant. Um, so, so I'm on, on that side to constantly prove that you can have tattoos and a mind mm. and a moral compass. John, you're quite a serious guy and you use a lot of these issues in your material, isn't mm. it? Do, do, do you find that you've been, you, 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 you've been taken seriously or do you even want to be taken seriously? Well, I mean, I think the people who know my work know what I'm doing yeah. and, and read my blogs and, and stuff like that. And they understand that you don't have to be a, a clown all the time. Um, and I think my humor comes from a serious interest in humanity. Like, mm. I'm really interested in human beings, mm. genuinely. And also, I believe that you have a mind. Like, that's a gift. So if you don't use your mind in your lifetime, you know, that's your own choice. But it's such a waste. It's such a waste. It's, it's the biggest processor that's known to the universe at this point. And um, we have all these billions of neurons. I mean, it's such an opportunity. And I'm also privileged. I grew up mm. in a situation where I had food, I had shelter, and I had education. I had access to the digital world. If I didn't use those things, I would just be a, like a spoiled brat because I don't see privilege in Africa sure, as having sure. a, a Bentley. Yeah. I see privilege in Africa as having running water, yes. having electricity when you switch it on, yeah. having food security. I'm hugely privileged. So if I didn't use those opportunities, if all I did was like make jokes, you know, like rude jokes, it would be such a waste. Let's, let's go to the rude jokes. Kay. Your first, your first stand-up gig. Do you yes. still remember it? Yes, I do. It was a disaster. <laughs> where it was, was that? horrific. <laughs> um, there are various forms of where I started my first gig. Okay. Um, and, and it's funny how mythology starts to grow. Like, I know people who were at my first gig who, who definitely weren't. But there were two that I can remember. The one was a, um, like an experimental comedy evening mm -hmm. at a very small pub in Durban called Jam and Sons uh, with myself and my very good friend Alan Adams. And we called it the Johnny Allen Show because at that time she was on the run for 
Eugene to Blanche nonsense in the back of a sports car with green underpants. <laughs> so it was relevant. And we were basically ignored um, for 20 minutes. We stood on stage and you could hear the ice melting Gosh. in drinks. It was horrific. It felt like four years. Uh, and Why then, didn't you run right there and say, you know what, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. It, not for me. Right. Well, if we'd known, if perhaps if we weren't so stupid, we, we may have given up. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting, even to this day, when I'm watching someone new, I don't look for brilliance. I look for thick skin. Uh, because no matter how good you are or you think you are, there mm. are going to be gigs where it's just going to fall apart. <laughs> So we had thick skin, and uh, and and that happened. And so we that's probably the one that I remember the best. Was it was just a disaster. I mean, but I was using a New York accent. I had a sort of a, a Bible, and I had a, an ANC hat on. A Catholic pre. I mean, it was all over the place. I didn't know what I was doing. I used to. I mean, I still do, but I, I genuinely um, was hugely um, sort of influenced by Peter Dirk A's videos when I was a child. And and so I thought maybe by having all these props I could be like him and I can honestly say today that I'm nothing like Peter Dirk S and and I'm worse off for it because he's truly um, a different class of weapon in the war of humor he's a proper missile that man mm. yeah a lot of firsts in your career is things like performing at the um, uh, Royal Albert Hall uh, you know your award back in t t 2007 mm. um, where do you want to see your career go? Is it, are you getting tired? Or do you still think there's a lot more that you can do? There's still a lot more to do. There's a lot of boundaries to push. Mm -hmm. um, as other people are building up, you know, um, making things normal, I want to keep breaking boundaries. Integrating technology into live stand-up is a big thing that I'm, I'm interested in and I'm doing a lot of experiments in. Um, I produce a lot of other people's shows. Um, so more of that. We want to push the boundaries because I love... I love to sit and listen to an artist tell me their story and what they want to communicate and then help them to realize that in, in the staging mm. of a show. So that's very, that will never get tired for me. Um, obviously things like Mass Hysteria and um, the big show Bitches that we did recently. Um, um, Thanks, you know, John. Thanks. What, what, you know, but is it a bad word? It's, it, it, you know, it's just, it's, it's a female dog and it's, it's reclaiming that word for female performers. So, so I don't think you'll get fired over that one. But, um, hey, John, I have to hold it quickly. We'll wrap up uh, okay. the career talks just now. Uh, after the break, we continue to get up close with John Flismus. Uh, any suggestions, comments? My Twitter handle is at Tepi Mutsukua. Stay with SBC News. Welcome back as we wrap up our conversation with John Flismus. As let's let's wrap up the career. Um, yeah, you know, before we started the show, you actually mentioned that you were writing my first first TV gig. Yes. When I was still a kid. Continuity dialogue for Tube. For Cody and Dub. Cody and Dub. That's right. And, that's yeah, right. but I never I never bumped into you or anything like no, that. No, I never used to go into the building. I wasn't proud of the job. I um I just wanted to deliver scripts, get my checks, so I could fund my comedy uh, career at that stage. Would you say that's why you survived so long that you were able to diversify your 100%. career? Hundred mm percent. -hmm. You got to hustle if you want to be an entertainer and uh, and uh, continue in South Africa. Mm. It, it, it's changing now, and there's a much bigger audience for stand up. Mm. And, and uh, but those days taught me what to do. So now when we write sketches for the comedy awards, when we put together the creative ideas for mass hysteria or, you know, um, um, even when I sit down to paint for my exhibitions, I, um, all that discipline helps me 
to discipline my own work. So it's mm -hmm. quite cool. Mm -hmm. What are some of the projects that you're working on right now? We're just wrapping Mass Hysteria for okay. 2013, which is the big, um, the, the big tour. We do the comedy government that tours the country. Um, okay. That's been really cool. And that's going to PE, I think, on Saturday night. Then it's finished. Uh, the Comics Choice Awards is about an eight-month production so we've finished wow. that now mm -hmm. so that's post-production mm -hmm. um, then we have the one more comics choice event uh, which is the um, the showcase where we showcase some of the younger talent from the winners and the nominees at the lyric in October and then there's a good chance I'll be doing some work with Comedy Central in October November um, we don't know what the details are yet and then we go into pre-production for next year uh, mm. And then I think in September I have a small oil painting exhibition which wow. has just come up. So I'll be putting eight of my paintings onto an exhibition. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that. Some of your interests out of uh, comedy. When you're talking about painting, I found out that you actually scuba dive, that you actually certified to be yes, a scuba diver. Yes, I'm an instructor. Um, I need to do some catch-up work. It's been a, a bit of a time since I've taught anyone. Yeah. But yes, I am a scuba instructor. Okay. I love scuba diving. And tell us about your painting work. Um, I've always loved South African art, okay. and, uh, and I bought some, and, uh, and then I became more interested. And then I actually met some of my favorite artists, particularly a great artist called Robert Hodgins. And we, we had a very brief friendship because Robert was old when I met him. He was 87, yeah. and he passed away when, when he was 89. Um, but one of the greatest, he's been called one of the greatest South African painters, and I would have to agree. Um, and Robert painted with me for a period of time. We, we painted together and he gave me some homework, which he left me with, basically. Mm. So this next exhibition, I didn't paint for quite a while when he died. I was very sad um, because he was truly an original human being. But um, I started again and uh, I want to finish the homework he left me. Mm. And that's what's going to go on, on mm, exhibition. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. I found it very interesting that you're doing things with your daughter that you didn't do when you were growing up. Mm. Things like surfing, etc. Well, why, why is that? What's going on? What do, you, what do you feel that you didn't experience then that you want to experience now or that you want her to experience? Um, I want her to have an experience of a dad who's active um, mm. and, and able to, while I'm still able to. I don't know mm. if I'll be able to do it when I'm older, but also as a, as a, as a gift to myself, I'm going to make sure that I'm active and fit so that my later years, which hopefully will be a bit quieter, I can spend active. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want my mind to stop and I don't want my body to give up. So, so I want to work until I literally collapse and I'm dead and I'll finish in the act of creation, just fall over dead. That would be the ultimate way to go. In the middle <laughs> of a stage. joke, hopefully, <laughs> um, so I can leave the audience hanging <laughs> and they have to fill in the punchline for themselves. <laughs> John, tell me, is John a South African first or a Zimbabwean? I'm a South African. Because I was born in Zim, but mm -hmm. I really didn't connect uh, mm -hmm. my own identity because I only really discovered myself later in life. And mm -hmm. so that happened here. Mm -hmm. And um, this country has been very good to me and treated me like a citizen. Therefore, I'm loyal to South Africa. And I go to Zim. I go and visit. There isn't much there of my family footprint. Okay. But it's cool to go and have a look and, and, um, and see a country that's worked through all the change that we still have to go through mm -hmm. in terms of a real conversion. I think we have one foot in, one foot out still. We, we haven't worked each other out um, in terms of what's old programming and what's new programming. Um, so it's exciting for me to go there. And I know it's, a lot of damage has been done, but I mm -hmm. think the people are cool and the spirit of the people is much more um, honest than we are. We still have hidden agendas in our mm -hmm. country. So hopefully we'll sort that all out. Um, but I'm a South African. Mm -hmm. When I go abroad, I travel as a South African comedian. I don't travel as a comedian trying to be international. Hmm. I'm a South African comedian, yeah. Okay. The one moment in your career that you felt, wow, I think I've made it. Um, I've never really felt that I've made it because I believe that self-doubt is a great driver and I think you must never be arrogant and sit back and go, okay, now I'm... Are you trying to tell me that you still think that, you know, I need to... You know what it is? On... I don't need to prove anything okay. to anyone, but, but for myself, I'm always looking forward. To get to shake Madiba's hand was a huge thing for me because mm. that's where my dirty mouth got me. It got me <laughs> to meet Madiba and it's always been a person. And I know it's very cliched now, especially because he's been ill, but that was a, a huge moment for me because of my interest in truly original human beings. Mm. To meet a shining example of humanity, that is a big thing for me. <clears throat> and the other one was to be able to work on the Royal Albert Hall stage because um, I was with other South African comics and it was a very, very rare opportunity to share the stage with the ghosts that have been there. Mm. So that was mm. quite big for me. So those two things probably are my biggest um, moments of 
thinking, I'm very grateful to have worked so hard because that's where it got me. Mm. Albert Hall stage and to shake Madiba's hand in his office was, was very cool. Mm. I'm enjoying the series, John. So just to wrap up, I would like to ask you, uh, what is the South Africa or even the Africa that you would like your daughter to inherit? Um, I think we must keep going the way we are because if I look at the way that my daughter interacts with her friends, mm -hmm. I can see an evolution between the way that my friends and I interact because of our programming. And if I look back at my parents, who are good people, they interact with their friends on a di in a different way. And mm -hmm. if I look at my grandfather, he had a very different, different way of looking at people. So I am seeing a change in, in honesty. I think we've, we've given ourselves a lot of PR. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of stuff to work through. But I think we're on the right track. And I think if we just let people be who they are, you know, we forget that there's only like 10% of humanity that's really rubbish. Mm. The vast majority of people and South Africans just want to get on and do stuff. If we just allowed that and encouraged it, I don't see how we're going wrong. I think we're moving through change and our, our country's like a teenager from a broken home. So there are problems, mm, mm. but every person has those issues. No one's an angel. So we'll move through that. I think we're on the right track. We're going to waste a lot of money. We're going to destroy opportunities. We're going to waste resources because <laughs> that's what people do. I, we have to leave it there. Thank okay. you so much for chatting to me. And that's how we wrap up today's edition of Up Close. Catch us same time weekdays on SMC News DSTV Channel 404. Comment suggestions at Tepi Motsekua on Twitter. See you next time. Bye. There was no African time before we came here because there was a reason to arrive somewhere. People had hope <laughs> and purpose. <laughs> you know, they had tribal gatherings. They just didn't have the same time system. They'd say, okay, when the moon is this big, I will see the... <laughs> then we came with boats and made people slaves, took away freedom, you know, invented colored people. And... Uh... <laughs>